So they should be able to hear you now. Remember which one that is. <laughs> Are we on? Yeah, just ask them to thumbs up if they can hear you. Pardon me? Yeah, they can hear you. <laughs> okay. Yep, I can hear you. Hello. I can only see a few of you, but good morning to everybody. Look at this camera. I'm sorry? This is the camera that they're seeing. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I also want to look at the people I'm talking to since there's nobody in here. <laughs> you know? Yeah, this is um, how you look at them. Okay. So does anybody want to do Amze this morning? <laughs> no. All righty. <laughs> then I will do Amze this morning. You'll have to put up with my voice. We'll start with a seven line prayer. to Shakyamuni Buddha. <clears throat> Oops. <laughs> Susan, I can read the prayers if you need somebody to read the prayers. I just didn't get off mute in time. Fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, and know of the world. Helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, flow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, O destroyer, that's gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, Helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, the destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, 
no destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, comes one of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, no destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, comes an ordinary being to be tamed. A supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector to you, I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme mark, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, and to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, a matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, Releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three, our devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Do this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators in the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. <clears throat> I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and unimagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicitas ripen. And may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. All my masters, my idams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith 
accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Arakiyami. So um, Karen or Elizabeth or Ellen, could somebody else do the Heart Sutra? I need to get this frog out of my throat and blow my nose and stuff before I get started. Okay, I'll do it. I, I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of Vultures Mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called <coughs> profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avagateshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avagateshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom. There is, he said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In this way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased stainless, not without stain, not deficient, and not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no I'm element and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on and up to including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment and also no non-attainment. Shariputra. Therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, Gati Gati, Paragati, Parasam Gati, Bodhisoha. We'll say this 21 times. Okay, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara saying, 
Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivati Putra, the Mahas Sattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas were overjoyed and highly praised. That's spoken by the Bhagavan. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Susan Farrar, and I am a student of Lama Jimpa, and welcome everybody to um, Lions Roar Dharma Center. So um, long before the pandemic started, Doug Kleinsmith and I um, were holding the space and practicing the Medicine Buddha practice on the fourth Friday of every month um, here in the Gompa. And I don't remember, Doug, maybe you remember, but we had been doing that for, I don't know, several years anyway. So after the stay at home order came along, we continued to uh, practice Medicine Buddha, only it moved, of course, to an online format. And instead of just doing it on the fourth Friday of the month, um, we ended up doing Medicine Buddha on the first, second, fourth, and sometimes fifth Friday of the month for the last 16 months. So I am so grateful to Doug for his constancy in doing this practice. Um, he has been totally devoted to it. And thank you, Doug, so much for all the, all the time and the effort and the time that we spent together. I really appreciate it. Because somewhere along the line, I have lost my motivation. I've lost my connection to Medicine Buddha. Um, you know, like here we are, here I am in the middle of immense chaos and tremendous suffering and tragedy globally, locally, you know, it's political, it's economic, it's racial, and of course it's environmental. And like everybody else, I'm uneasy, I'm worried. Um, I do what little I can on an individual basis but you know, it's not a lot. And finally, when the withdrawal from Afghanistan began, I realized that I was really kind of over the edge with being sort of overwhelmed, I guess, um, by all that was going on. Um, I want to be able to, I feel that I am called, that probably we are all called to be able to meet these really, really difficult times with healing, with compassion, with love, with kindness. And I'm feeling that I'm, my, I'm, I'm getting empty. You know, um, I'm not able to embody those qualities to the extent that I feel like I want to. Um, and I'm just kind of empty. So I need to replenish this reservoir, this internal reservoir of emotional fortitude, of strength, um, of appreciation even, you know, um, and I think one of the ways, I know one of the ways to do that um, is through the Medicine Buddha practice. I've been doing it for many, many years. Um, that practice along with others such as Chen Rezig and Vajrasattva, they help and have helped in the past and will help now to soothe all of this anxiety, at least some of it, and the worry that I am feeling so that I can replenish this emotional reservoir and so that I can show up so that I can be present with the qualities that I feel I really want to have in, in the world today. Um,
in the long sadhana, in the long text of Medicine Buddha, this phrase is, rep is, is repeated at the closing of each one of the seven Medicine Buddhas. It goes like this. And when we pass away from this life, may we be born from a lotus in that Buddha field, qualities complete become a vessel for transmitting the teachings of conquerors such as medicine guru, king of doctors, and cause them to light. And so for me, the key phrase in there is become a vessel for transmitting the teachings. Um, in the shorter practice, there is a phrase that says, just like guru medicine Buddha, may I also become a compassionate guide for sentient beings. So in those, those two practices, and indeed probably all of our practices, the instructions are pretty clear that we are, I am needing to embody the qualities of Medicine Buddha. And so the question that I ask myself is how am I gonna get back in touch with this practice? Um, how am I going to gain the confidence and the conviction in this practice that it's going to help me, that it's going to help me regain, you know, some of the, the inspiration and the qualities that I want to, that I want to come forth with. So that's, what this talk is about is going to cover some of the ground that um, I've been doing in terms of searching for the answer to this. So first of all, what I did is what I always do, which is go to the teachings. Um, around the beginning of July, I think it was over the 4th of July, uh, Sevasti Abbey had a Medicine Buddha retreat uh, for four or five days. And I didn't take the retreat, unfortunately. I don't remember quite why I didn't, but all the teachings were online. And so when I was on vacation, uh, one of the things that I did was start to listen and to all of those teachings. And the first question that Venerable Children asks is, what does healing mean? So that's kind of where I started in this search to reconnect. It's a complicated question and it's a multi-leveled and complicated answer. The first thing that she talked about and that I started to reflect on is how do I enter this practice on those Friday evenings at seven o'clock? So the routine has been okay i need to fix some dinner and then i need to clean the kitchen and then i need to go on for a walk and then i need to come back and turn on the computer and sit down and do the medicine buddha practice and you know that's probably not the best preparation for having the attitude to sit down and do a practice like medicine buddha to do any kind of a practice so i needed to take a look at that um, and what the suggestion was, was take a look at the Medicine Buddha himself. So I have a Medicine Buddha Tonka, and most of us have got, you know, at least pictures of Medicine Buddha. And he's very tranquil. You know, the blue is a very, very tranquil color. His countenance is very tranquil. His seating is very tranquil. Um, his eyes are open and receptive. They're seeing clearly. He is holding a medicinal plant in one hand and a bowl of healing nectar in the other hand. So I need to enter the practice the way the Medicine Buddha is showing me to enter the practice which is open, relaxed, receptive, and to have every confidence that this time that I'm gonna be spending is going to be beneficial. That those healing plants and nectars that are being offered are, have no bad side effects and are offered there for my healing. 
So I need to sort of come into the practice the same way that the medicine Buddha is coming into the practice. And the other thing that I need to do um, is to recognize that I can't do this on my own, that I need help, that you know I need healing, I need some relief, and I can't do this on my own. I, I need some help. And so I ask the Medicine Buddha to let me come into the space and to also let himself, itself, into the space. Lama added the perspective when I was talking to him about this, that this is really a life force practice. This is not an analytical practice. And indeed, it's actually kind of magical. Um, it's a little like um, chaplaincy. When a chaplain enters the room of a patient, enters into the space of a patient, there is really no idea on the chaplain's part of what is needed. But there is something that is always definitely known, and that's that we always need emotional ease and relief. So when I'm entering this practice, I do it very much the way that I would enter the room of a, of a hospital patient. I don't know what's needed, but I know for sure that I need some ease and I need some relief. So is all of that making sense? Does it, anybody have any comments, stories to share that sort of along those lines. If you do, just raise your hand and either Connor or I will see it. OK. So the first few pages of the text are opening prayers, similar to what we just did. And of course, the question is, is what's my mind like when I'm reciting them? These opening prayers um, in Medicine Buddha um, are meant to create the conditions um, of merit and purification that allow the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas to enter the space and to show them that I'm open to their presence. So um, in the long version of the practice, there is this recitation. We say, compassionate protectors in degenerate times, seven shigatas, Buddha Shakyamuni, Holy Dharma, bodhisattvas and guardians, invited as the support and protector refuge to protect others and myself. May you come here, gather, and grant your blessings. So we're inviting, inviting them in. And in the shorter version of the Medicine Buddha practice, it begins with a very beautiful visualization of Medicine Buddha, which is inviting him in and just, you know, just visualizing him there in the space in front of us. So um, Venerable Children's Lecture, she was reminded me of a, a metaphor that I think is really useful, um, the metaphor of a radio. Like the energy waves of compassion or purification, healing, whatever it is that we're looking for, all of those are constantly being sent out to the 10 directions by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. But their ability to get through to folks depends on our receptivity. Do I have the radio turned on? You know, like it's all out there. Do I have the radio turned on and how high is the volume? So I like that metaphor. And um, so I need to sit down and turn the, turn the radio on and turn up the volume. On a practical level, so you know that's the emotional, um, psychological entrance into the practice. On a practical level, um, I'm finding also some disturbances that I can do something about. Um, First, there is, you know, like there was this whole process I go through of eating and cleaning and taking the dog out and all that stuff. 
So I need to enter the practice with about five or 10 minutes of just sitting and doing mantra or just sitting and breathing and just allowing myself to open up and get ready to do the practice. Um, I'm also have been doing uh, practices um, in front of the laptop in my office, uh, my spare room, which serves as an office and also as an exercise space. So that may not be really conducive to great practice. I mean, my spin bike is behind me and there's some weights over there and the desk is full of papers and files and books. And, you know, it's not like a really conducive environment. So I need to move to another area to do these practices. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what to do about this, but the laptop itself um, is kind of a, an issue for me. It's constrictive. I feel a little straight jacketed by it. I feel kind of pressured by the laptop in that, you know, I don't want to waste anybody's time. And, you know, I need to get on and get off. So I just, um, uh, I figured a workaround to that, but it's, it's the laptop itself is just kind of an issue. That's one of the reasons I'm in the temple today. Even though there's nobody here but Connor, um, it's really a much more conducive environment. Um, the third thing that I feel is hampering um, my ability to really engage with the practice is the fact that we are always doing the long text. And I think for me um, right now, the long text is too long and too repetitious to do online. So sorry, Doug, but when, <laughs> you know, and most people really prefer the long text, but for the time being, while I'm sort of getting myself back into the, the frame of this, um, when uh, at least on the fourth Fridays, we'll probably be doing the short Medicine Buddha text. I feel more connected right now with that. Um, the other element that I need to engage with more is my imagination. So um, and let me just quickly ask, does anybody else have this issue with a laptop like I do, this feeling, this sort of pressure to get on and get off? Yeah. No? Yeah? Doug? Yes, Trish. Yes, I do. I have a great uh, time doing practice on a laptop, a hard type rather. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. If somebody's speaking, I cannot hear you. Doug, you raised your hand. What'd you say? I literally raised my hand. <laughs> oh, you just raised your hand and said, yeah. yeah I know that one of the issues is where it is. It's sometimes I move it around. So it looks, so I sometimes move it around. Can you hear me? Kinda. Okay. Yeah, everything seems kind of quiet. I I kind of I sometimes move the laptop around, and sometimes I take it away from what I use as my work desk. Yeah. Yeah. I don't sit at my laptop. I have the sound on external speakers. I don't look at it all the time. I listen to it more like a radio, and I move about the entire house. That's my solution for it. Okay, thank you. What yeah. about, well, I, I have an iPad and I actually, like right now I'm sitting in the living room, but actually when we go to do practices online, I put it on my altar so that I am sitting in front of my altar. And you're right that the space that you're sitting in makes a big difference to me. So when, when I'm sitting in front of my altar, it's much easier for me to connect than when I'm sitting or walking around my house or drinking coffee or whatever else I might be doing while I'm online. So it's really, to me, it's really important for the practices to, to be at my altar and sitting there as though I were doing it myself, by myself. And then you have the added joy of doing it with others. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, good suggestions, all of them. Um, the other element that I've found that I have not been incorporating nearly to the degree that I can is my imagination. Um, one of the obstacles is that I've done this sadhana so often that it's sort of become mechanical for me. It's unvarying. And that's because I'm not applying my imagination. Um, so I need to take more time and I need to become more creative. So as the um, folks just suggested, I have changed the space and I've moved my laptop when I do the practices into the place where my altar and my meditation cushions are. And I've placed it so that I'm not looking at it. I'm looking at my altar. Um, after all, the people, you know, they don't need to see me because they're looking at the text, right? Um, I'm kind of over on the side now um, if, if, uh, in, in the view, but I have the, the lap, laptop over on the side to me and I'm looking straight onto my altar. So that has made a difference. Um, and I'm imagining as I've been describing that the Medicine Buddha is in the room. And also um, at the end of these practices, we have been naming the people to whom we are dedicating the practice to. And I'm finding that it is more effective for me to bring those people into the room right from the get go to, you know, it could be all of the Afghan refugees, right? Or it could be just my brother-in-law who's in a hospital now. So it doesn't matter who or how many, but whoever I'm dedicating that practice to, I bring them into the room right at the beginning along with the Medicine Buddha. And so um, I think, I don't know if we're gonna make this a, a practice for each time we do it, but I'm now doing the dedication at the, or not, not the prayer dedication, but the dedication of the people um, that I'm making, doing the practice for, I'm bringing that to the first part of the practice so that we're naming that before we even begin. So that's helpful. Um, there is a visualization, um, like I said, in the short text that is really, really helpful. And I was reminded by the, lectures from Shavasti Abbey that the deities are light. There's nothing solid about them. They are made of light. They're three-dimensional, but they're made of light. And if I can picture them in the long practice stacked on top of my head as they're made of light and watch them dissolve one into the other, it's really, really simple because they're made of light. So it just dissolves and then it can dissolve into me. So um, reminding myself of, of what they are made of is, is quite helpful. Um, also making sure that I have placed the medicine Buddha on the top of everybody's head that is in the room with me, whether they're on a Zoom session or if they're people are beings, animals, even that I've invited into the room for dedication. Um, in the short practice, we make a request to Medicine Buddha to please inspire my mind. There's four or five requests at the beginning of that practice. And we end it with please inspire my mind. So, you know, if I think of someone who is inspirational, um, Lama Jimpa or Venerable Children or any number of other kinds of people, um, when I'm picturing them, I'm not just picturing them physically. Sometimes it's not even very clear physically, but what I do feel and picture is their qualities because that's what makes them inspirational to me. Their qualities of kindness, of gentleness, of um, having really, really a good wisdom and skillful means, um, sense of humor, um, being very knowledgeable about something, um, just 
the qualities is what comes to mind. And so when I'm called upon, when I'm thinking of Medicine Buddha, what I'm thinking of are qualities. I'm thinking of the qualities of healing and calming and care, all embodied in that three-dimensional light fixture that's in front of me. So it's the qualities that are coming through to me. Um, so we recite, um, for instance, this is one of the things of the small, from the short sadhana. I request you, Bhagavan, master of healing, who sky colored holy body of lapis lazuli signifies omniscient wisdom and compassion as vast as limitless space. Please inspire my mind. So I'm asking for the Medicine Buddha to bring all of those qualities and to, of caring and healing, to inspire and transpire and transform and fill my mind with those qualities. So if I take the time to relax and to settle in, then that whole mechanical feeling just dissipates. And um, I can receive some relief when I ask for it. And that's sort of the kernel of the practice is we're asking for relief. And so the idea is that doing the practice brings relief, brings some relaxation, brings some healing. Um, we actually, you know, the way that we ask for it in the long practice, we recite over and over again, please may the pledges you made ripen upon myself and all sentient beings right now. May all my pure prayers succeed immediately. We're asking for help. In the shorter text, um, there is this incredible visualization. Where does it go? I brought the practice with me. Where it says, um, infinite blue rays of light stream down from the heart and body of the king of medicine. The light completely fills your body from head to toe, purifying all diseases. If you have any pain or any specific illnesses, focus the blue light directly to this spot and visualize the light burning away the pain and disease. So, you know, we're asking for relief and that visualization just brings it. I mean, all of everything that I need is in these practices. I just need to use it. I just need to get back in touch with it. So um, all of that makes sense. Anybody got any comments or questions? I had something to add. I don't know if you can hear me though. I um, unmuted. Can you hear me? I can now, yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, I was just reading in a book, I don't remember which one it was, it was talking about the experience of emptiness and how at first it's really exciting when you get those glimpses and when you start seeing it. And then, um, then he was saying, then emptiness becomes very ordinary and boring. <laughs> so I don't know, the way, I, the way I'm looking at it is that you're doing such a great job that you've applied yourself for so long that it's become boring and ordinary um, and now you're challenged with the next step which is i, I don't see it as reconnecting so much as, as as kind of evolving in your integration of it perhaps and it's very interesting for me to watch how you're doing that um, you know, because it's very easy to be inspired in the beginning, but later on, I don't know. I just think it's part of the path. And I think that you're doing a great job and it's really that's cool. That's a great perspective. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Anybody else? Karen? Yeah, I'll say some, I'll say one more thing. Um, and you brought it up that that I, when I, um, to me, the Yidams that I practice, the Yidam practices that I do, 
um, real important to connect a guru with that. And whether it's Lama or whoever, you know, Chota Rinpoche who gave us the great empowerment for Medicine Buddha or Jado Rinpoche who gave us an empowerment for Medicine Buddha. I try to, to think of them and it sounds like you do do that, but that does help me uh, to, you know, because it's, that's that's all in emptiness. You need all of them, <laughs> the guru and the yidam and us all together somehow, you know, so that that helps me a lot to to bring them in. And it sounds like you do do that. But I just want to say I I find that to be really important to. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and and you know, part of the opening prayers are su is succession, right? So, yeah, that that happens during that recitation. Anybody else? Okay. So, like Lama said, this is a life force practice, not an analytical practice. And he said, and I thought this was interesting, that Medicine Buddha, and um, you know, I guess this would extend also to Vajra, very definitely to Vajrasattva, possibly um, also to Avalokiteshvara, that this practice is meant foremost to heal the practitioner. It's meant to help the practitioner so that she or he can restore that reservoir that I was talking about at the beginning, that you can revitalize those energies of compassion and love and healing and just the energy, just revitalize that energy. So for me, I'm thinking this is a life force practice and it's not really necessary to do an analytical analysis, an analytical analysis, to do an analysis of why I'm out of balance or why I'm feeling depleted. The fact is I am, and I am feeling depleted and I need help and I need to get some relief. And the why isn't really all that necessary. Um, it's kind of like there's a sutra, right? I mean, that we all know where someone's been shot with an arrow. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and go, huh, I wonder who shot that thing. I wonder who's trying to, to hurt me. I wonder what this arrow is made out of. I wonder who made the arrow. I mean, are you going to do all that analysis or are you going to take the arrow out? We're going to take the arrow out. We're not going to do all of that analysis. The analysis is not helping relieve the pain that's been inflicted. So this medicine Buddha practice and others as well is a way to soothe and to start to heal the pain from the arrow, regardless of the origin or the reason for the pain and the suffering. So, you know, I, I hope that makes sense because I mean, we do do a lot of analysis, but that's not what we need to do. That's not what I need to do anyway when I'm doing the Medicine Buddha practice. I'm just asking for relief and I need to use my imagination and be open to receiving the relief that I can get through the practice. So finally, and this kind of relates a little bit, thank you to Autumn, what she just said. I've been thinking about some of the teachings that Lama has been doing on um, the links of dependent origination and last week when he was talking about grasping. And You know, this is not like, you know, thought all the way through yet. Um, and I don't really know if it's going to be, but he talked about having nostalgia for samsara. And our conscious, subconscious, unconscious grasping is so subtle and so deep that there is, we can't get to it with ordinary mind. We just cannot get to it through ordinary mind. And shamatha is one of the techniques that we all do 
to get beyond ordinary consciousness, to get beyond ordinary mind, and to reach some of those more subtle levels of suffering that is going on. And these structured practices, such as Medicine Buddha, is another way to get out of ordinary mind, to get out of the ordinary consciousness and to start digging deeper into the subtle, subtle levels that are, that are you know, the samsaric suffering. Um, but it's very, very deep. It isn't, it isn't just so obvious. And I think that kind of ties a little bit into what, um, to what Autumn was saying. Maybe I need to get deeper. I'm not getting deep enough. Um, so I think that, you know, um, first of all, doing, preparing this talk was really, really helpful um, in terms of revitalizing that practice and sort of re enforcing my need and my, my inspiration for doing the practice. And I think that, you know, working daily with both of these techniques, with doing a shamatha practice daily, but also doing a structured practice, Medicine Buddha, Chen Rezig, Rajasattva, we now have this new practice that I'm looking forward to learning. Um, if I can do those on a regular basis, that eventually it's going to allow me to start embodying, to have the energy to manifest and to really feel the qualities that I feel that I really need to feel, to be present in the world today and to um, be constructive and to be compassionate in this really, really very difficult world. So, um, that's all I've got to say. So we'll open it up for more questions and comments and stories, people with their own stories. Nobody has anything to share. Nobody's had any problems with their practice, please. <laughs> I just oh. wanted to say that I can apply what you said to all our practices that we do. I can apply what we're saying to all the practices we do. Yeah. All of the recitations. All I need is a little more time to relax and prepare before. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Ellen? Yeah, I, I don't have any comments or any questions really, but I really appreciate the talk because I think this kind of flatness that you describe is something that a lot of us experience. I certainly do. And we don't tend to talk about it. You know, we just tend to talk about the successes um, and don't often get together and talk about these challenges. So I, I really appreciate your talk today and I found it helpful. Thank okay. you. Thank you. You know, Susan, I've done the Medicine Buddha incorrectly and <laughs> correctly and in situations in front of my altar, which is really minimal, but a, a lot of the time, when I worked as a res my residency at UC Davis, I used it in extreme circumstance. And that really, uh, during codes, because I don't pray to God. And so I would set, what I would call set the energy for everybody in the room, including um, the individual who was in distress. And that really provided uh, super deep meaning of the Medicine Buddha in terms of healing, not only myself, but everybody in the room who was suffering together and trying to save life. So being able to take your practice 
and mutate it for the circumstance, perhaps to think of it as a chaplaincy practice, uh, really um, made it living and helped me embody it. Uh, that's just a suggestion that was not the usual experience, but you can you can do it on the ground level. It has a lot of power on the ground level. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Hi, Susan. It's Andrew. Can you hear me? Hey, I can. Hello. Hey there. Thank you for your talk. Um, I've always really connected with medicine Buddha practice as well. Uh, I think uh, part of it's because I've taken on this role of a healer and um, just have always maybe had this extra sensitive sense of other people's suffering and um, it can get rather exhausting and burnout is a, a very real concern. Uh, I know I have certainly felt it at, at various times and I really appreciated your um, comment about how medicine to practice first and foremost is for ourselves. Um, that we really need that um, energy and, and life force to continue to do the work we're doing. And in mundane psychology biz, we talk about the oxygen mask analogy. You know, when you're in an airplane, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. And, I know the practice is set up, at least the short version, um, with our, our own healing before we can think about other people. And so I think that's, that's a good reminder that um, that space gives us the energy to, to do the bodhisattva work that we do. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment or a question or a story to tell? Hey, Susan, this is JD. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, it really resonated with me. Um, and I always appreciate hearing um, real stories of, you know, working through the material, the Dharma, and in a very real way. So thank you again. Um, one of the things I struggle with is sometimes um, it's the language barrier that as a Westerner coming to, um, you know, saying words that I don't really understand or doing just, you know, mudras that I don't fully understand either and feeling a, a kind of a, a disconnect or a little bit of a fraud and having to push past that. And of course, some of that's pushing myself to learn the terms and the meaning, but doing all of that work while trying to rest my mind or, you know, do a, do a meditation is sometimes um, more, more of a grappling, more of a wrestling match than, than a meditation. But um, I'm working through it. I'm working on it. I wouldn't say I'm working through it. I'm working on it. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, difficulties do come up, that's for sure, in lots of different forms. Okay. So thank you for listening to the talk. And I think we'll do closing prayers, yeah? I'm getting some texts <laughs> that I think has to do with, oh well, okay. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. 
May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful, Chen Resig, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losong, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manzushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you. Hope to see you later. Thank you, Susan. Oh. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Susan.